going to do a field test for Sailor's Rio Fuku, Rio Fuka, um, double sided food aid pen. And what I'm really testing for is waterproofness and copic proofness. Now, the Sailor Mitsuo Ida is both of those things, but it's getting increasingly difficult to find and I'm running out of places where I can get it. So I wanted to switch and since they're both made by Sailor and they look very similar once you, once you get past the external differences, I was really hoping they might be the same sort of thing. So I have a Sailor Mitsuo Ida over here. You guys have seen me use this in many, 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 many videos. And I have the uh, Rio Fuka over here. And Sailor used to make another double-sided um, calligraphy slash fude pen. Um, and it was pretty much identical to the Mitsuo Ida, except for like um, the body was all gray. Um, but it was also Copic and uh, watercolor proof. That gives me reason to hope that this one over here is the same way. So I'm gonna go ahead and cap my Mitsuo Ida. And I'm not gonna be testing the Mitsuo Ida because I already know how it works. I'm just going to be testing the Rio Fuka. And I need to grab some scrap watercolor right here. So with these sort of things, you need to let them dry for 24 hours regardless. That is the best way to ensure that you're going to get, hmm, that looks like a fiber brush. Let's see. No, same kind of brush. You need to let it dry for 24 hours to ensure alcohol proofness and waterproofness. So that's what I'm gonna do. And um, I'm just gonna go ahead and state now that so even if this doesn't work and I run out of sources for my Sailor brush pins, Sakura of America makes these Pigma Pro brushes and the FB is about the same size, maybe a little bit smaller than the Sailor. And the BB is a little bit bigger, but way more useful. Has much better flex than the large brush on here. So even if the uh, Rio Fuka doesn't work, I do still have options that I can turn to. I, it's just super handy to have such a, a versatile pen in one package. I only need one pen and I've got two tips. So here's hoping that this one works as well. And I ordered this pen, the Rio Fuca, off of a site that I haven't yet tried before called J Stationery. And I ordered it on the 13th and today is the 18th. So they have pretty, pretty speedy shipping. And the brush itself was $3 and I paid $2.85 for first class mail. And I ordered only ordered one because I wasn't sure. If this works, I'm going to end up ordering like 10 at a time and that way I can save on shipping. So if this works, we have a new sort of resource to turn to. So I will check in with you guys tomorrow to test for Copic and alcohol safeness, safety, proofness, whatever, you know what I mean. I'll see you guys then. So here we are again with the Rio Fuca and it's been 24 hours since I've applied the ink. So I've got a Prismacolor alcohol marker and I, that doesn't have enough. I've got some water and a mister and we're gonna see if this is alcohol and waterproof. And this was applied by the larger end. So this row here, this row here is applied with the smaller end. So it looks like with the larger end, you will get some smearing. Let's try the smaller end. Smaller end looks like it too. Now, let's try the water. Doesn't seem to be going anywhere. So, I think what I'm going to do is, um, I need to do a control. So, I'm gonna get out a good old Sailor Mitsuo Ida. And I'm 
also going to pull out, so I need to mark this. But not with that, doesn't want to write. So work and pinch. So we're going to come back and test the mitzvah Ida, just as a control. Also going to let the Rio, Rio Fuca dry for 48 hours instead of 24 hours. And we'll see if that doesn't make a difference. So I will see you guys tomorrow and the next day with further continuations of this test. Hey guys, so I was sick yesterday so I couldn't complete my tests, but I'm going to try and get them finished today. So instead of 24 hours, the Mitsuo Ida has dried for 48 hours, and instead of 48 hours, the Rio Fuca has dried for 62. So we're gonna start with alcohol marker. And it takes a lot of repeated application over the Mitsuo Ida to get it to start to smear. Let me pull that in for you guys. And then we're gonna go with the Rio Fuca. And it seems like the extended dry time really works in its favor because it has about the same amount of smear as the Mitsuo Ida does. And I use the Mitsuo Ida regularly with um, no adverse effects in terms of um, alcohol markers. So here's the water just for completion. No smearing on either. So it seems that with a longer dry time, the Rio Fuca from Sailor is um, moderately copic proof and wa entirely waterproof. I'm going to have to try it out in a field test because you guys know that's the only way we can really know for sure. So I will see you guys with that another day. So today we're doing the inking portion of the Rio Fuca field test. I'm trying to find an alternative or other options to the Sailor Mitsuo Ida, which is one of my favorite waterproof and Copic proof brush pens. I have one in package over here, but it can be kind of difficult to find. I only know of one American source and I can't seem to find them on eBay and I don't have any Japanese sources. So it's time to try and find an alternative. Sakura of America does make um, alcohol marker proof and waterproof brush pins that are great, but I've gotten so spoiled by having a brush pin that has two sides in one. And like the Mitsuo Ida, the Sailor Rio Fuca has a large brush end and a small brush end, and it is slightly more ergonomic. Now, previously I've done tests that show that, um, and these are the alcohol marker tests. The Rio Fuca is about as waterproof as the Mitsuo Ida. Uh, I mean, about as Copic proof as the Mitsuo Ida. So as long as I let it dry and I don't try to Copic over like large areas of black, we shouldn't get problems with smearing. And I'm doing this test on fluid watercolor paper. I like using it for um, alcohol marker illustrations. It is a heavier watercolor paper, so it may not work for what you're looking for. And the Sailor Rio Fuca is made by the same company that makes the Sailor Mitsuo Ida. It would, that would be Sailor. And both of these are brush pins that were designed by calligraphers or um, they're branded by calligraphers. Mitsuo Ida is a calligrapher, Rio Fuca is a calligrapher. And what's neat about the Rio Fuca is it's a little bit more ergonomic than the midsole Ida. Although, uh, yeah, and the caps post like kind of the opposite way you would expect caps to post, which is fine. It's just handy that they post at all. And I ordered this, let me see. I don't think I have the, re the receipt anymore. But I ordered this from a different Japanese stationery site than I usually frequent. Um, and you can check out my other videos to find out where I ordered these. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started with inking this piece. It's Kara, uh, the 
mother of the main character from my ongoing children's comic, Seven Inch Care, her mother, Meldina, standing in front of a field of, or a bunch of mint. I thought it would be a fun illustration. I don't draw her for these field tests like ever, so I thought it would be nice to do something like that. So this piece is inked and I'm going to let it dry for about 48 hours before I apply Copic marker and other alcohol markers on top of it. Just to be sure, since my preliminary test did show a bit more smearing than with um, after allowing it to dry. But the Mitzel Ida smears after even after 48 hours as well, it's just very rarely noticeable um, because I'm applying such small amounts of it to the page with this when I'm doing color line art. So I will check back in with you guys in a couple of days when I'm ready to do my markers. So today we're going to be completing the field test for the Sailor Rio Fuca brush pin. Um, and to start out with, I've got a couple heavy hitters. I've got Copic Wides and I've got alcohol mists, homemade alcohol mists. So we're gonna start by applying a layer of green and it is G94 all across the background. I've already gone ahead and masked this off. I really like the combination of masking in Copic Wides to apply a wash of like a semi-uniform to uniform wash of color in the background. It's just so much easier than what I used to do. And since it's not a, a spray, it's less likely to soak underneath. So you can get a, a crisper result than I used to be able to get or than I get with, um, with the mists. And my intention isn't to get perfect coverage because I do intend on coloring in these mint leaves, at least somewhat, at least adding some details to them. Um, I just wanted to fill it in enough that it does serve as a good background. So now for a few spritzes of rubbing alcohol and I'm kind of running low. And I'll let that dry. This basically acts like a colorless blender would. And it's cheaper, rubbing alcohol is cheaper. So I will let that dry and then I will spray my uh, 
my green spray. This is Ranger's Botanical in a cheap uh, spray bottle, and I have tutorials on how to do that on the channel. And so far, I did let my Sailor Real Fuca ink dry for, oh my goodness, like five or six days. And this is on water, heavy watercolor paper. Um, so there is no, no um, sort of surface treatment that might affect the dry time or might affect your, your inks smearing. Um, so do keep that in mind. This isn't a comprehensive test. It's mostly a test for me to see how this works and I'm sharing it with you. Um, so it looks like that is dried and I can go ahead and spray. And the higher up you spray, the more sort of a diffused mist you're gonna get. And if you allow the ink to dry, it will be less likely to pool and seep underneath your image, which is a problem I have frequently. I also think I want sort of a fresh green up here by the top. It's where the mask is super beneficial because otherwise all of this would be on her. And I love how vibrant these alcohol inks look on the plastic. Um, if you want effects like that, you can use um, like a photo paper or a glossy paper, a paper with a heavy coating basically, which is not what I'm using. And let's go with some indigo towards the bottom. It's so pretty like that. You really have to hold it at a distance. Okay, and I'm going to let this dry for a little while. All right, so that indigo dry. Now it's time to go back in with botanical. And my cat is sitting on my lap and he is like getting really anxious about those alcohol inks. So I need to allow this to dry before I can continue working on it. So I'm gonna move that out of the way and go ahead and get this cleaned up. And one of my favorite little techniques when I have a mess like this, and I may not have enough rubbing alcohol to do anything about it, um, is I love to salvage all of this ink. I like to spray it with rubbing alcohol and then press a sheet of paper into it. And what that, if I get it just right, I actually get this sort of frame. Um, and I have tutorials coming up on how to do that and how to use that that I'm excited to share with you guys. Um, because it's just neat to be able to salvage some of that stuff and it also makes what I have go a little bit further. Um, and I also like this sort of um, element of chaos. Every now and then in my work is really nice, control chaos. So I am going to get back to you guys. So since I've still got my mask on and since I'm already making a mess, I pulled out my Tim Holtz sort of little air spritzer. Um, and I do have a Copic airbrush system, but I've never actually used it. Um, and let's see. Totally watch the videos on how to do this. I remove the outer ring. I place this in so it would be near but not oh it would touch it if it wanted to be near but not touch it apparently it's gonna do that regardless Ooh, not that tight you know what maybe we should be using the chisel let's let's do a little demonstration first before we get started with this here's some scratch paper So, there is an airbrush effect. Let's try with the other side. I don't wanna ruin my precious super tips. Oh, okay, all right. I can get a little bit larger of a... Still not a very large spread though. You're gonna get a larger spread with your with your spray bottles but this should also and this thing is like hard to hard to maneuver there we go you get a larger spread uh, with your spray bottles if that's something you're looking for 
this marker may just not be juicy enough too. I know this is probably painful for some of you guys <laughs> watching me troubleshoot this thing. Ooh, you get a much finer mist with this thing than you do with the spray bottles, at least with indigo. A little bit tiring to use it though. It's so unwieldy. Can't imagine trying to use this for like a large surface sprayzer. A little bit easier to maneuver. It just doesn't seem to put out that much ink though. Um, so any of you, they make it seem so easy in those videos. Any of you guys who are more familiar with this product, um, if you can give me any sort of pointers on this, because I'm sure I'm doing it wrong, um, please let me know in the comment section. Because I've had this thing for like six months and uh, this is the first time I've actually gotten it to kind of sort of work and it's still not really working. So I would really like to hear what I'm doing wrong. If there's a knack to it, please let me know. But I guess I'm gonna move away from that. Move back towards uh, just using traditional markers. Sort of pull some of that green back in, especially on the defined leaf shapes. And again, the, my big problem with this sort of masking Criscuit that I'm using is uh, it leaves a sticky residue that kind of catches on your hand. So if any of you guys happen to know of any sort of masking product that works better, other than masking fluid, because I've just had so many problems with masking fluid, please let me know because um, this doesn't necessarily work so well for me. I'm just sort of doing a base layer of color on the mint in the background, and this is G16, if you're curious. And if you even, uh, like, you can pick up color from the plastic over here if you, you know, want to utilize that as well. There's no reason not to. And I like adding in leaves other than the ones I've drawn in sort of helps blend the background with the drawn leaves. So if you're um, a stamper, that is a technique you should certainly consider is sort of freehanding in your own design in the background too, to sort of blend the difference between the stamp and the rest of the image. And I've definitely seen some stampers do it. I've seen <laughs> some who are so reliant on their stamps to tell them what to do. Come on, you guys, you're artists too. Most of us just, um, most of us work from reference anyway, so. And if you're able to draw in your own images to an extent, like, you know, I'm not expecting like people or animals or houses or whatever like that, but just like little accents, you are really um, extending your own stamp collection, what you already have. You it means you don't need to go out and buy star stamps. I mean, what a, what a waste of money. Or heart stamps or whatever. It means you're only spending money on the stamps you know you could not draw. Or it would take you so long to draw it that you wouldn't be able to enjoy making cards anymore. So we're gonna switch now from G16 over to G07, which is a much lighter sort of green for these leaves coming up at the top. And what's nice about these heavier watercolor papers, this is Fluid's um, 140 pound cold press. It is not the best watercolor paper out there. If you're gonna use markers, I really don't recommend you use the best watercolor marker pa watercolor paper out there. I really recommend you use like Canson's Biggie XL paper because it's thick and it's tough, but it doesn't have as much um, of a surface texture because it's not handmade, it's um, machine made. And it has a lot of cellulose in it rather than like um, cotton rag. And the cotton rag is great, great for watercolors, but not great for markers. However, the cellulose is just fine for, for markers. It's not as archival, but to be frank, markers aren't an archival medium either. 
they're a very immediate medium, but I mean, they are dye based, so many of them will use lose their vibrancy over time. So, I mean, it's great if you are doing、um, sort of like convention commissions, right? Where most of the people who purchase those commissions are going to be tired of the character they had drawn in a year,、um, or they, they understand that it can't be displayed in direct sunlight,、um, or,、uh, you know, You're going to be digitizing everything anyway, so it doesn't really matter, right? But it's not intended for、um, long term display or for like a heritage sort of application. So, if it's the sort of thing you, can see, you could seriously see yourself giving to your kids, giving to your grandkids,、um, and then putting it up for you know, 20, 30 years, markers are probably not the best media for it. It's going to lose a lot of its vibrancy. So,、um, but the plus side to watercolor papers like this is、um, if you don't like coated papers, and I don't always want to work with coated papers. In fact, I often don't want to work with coated papers.、Um, if you don't care for coated papers, these are a great alternative. They're inexpensive as well. Many of them come pre attached to the pad. So,、um, you know, if you're doing mixed media with watercolor, you don't have to stretch it. Um, again, it also opens you up to these mixed media techniques, like with watercolor or like gouache or wetter me media that would cause marker paper to curl up.、Um, it can also take a lot of marker without、uh, you know, bleeding through or without the layers becoming so ex excessive that you can't apply further layers. So, depending on how you want to use your markers,、uh, watercolor papers like this might be a really great. Avenue for exploration. And you don't really want to use anything that has too much of a tooth to it because it can tear up your nibs. So,、um, again, another reason I mean, I love Canton arches. I use arches、um, for my nicer seven inch Kara standalone illustrations.、Um, I, it's a joy to paint on, but I don't use it for marker illustrations because that would be a waste. That is not the best paper for the product. And I know、um, <laughs> I really do enjoy watching the, <laughs> the Ranger CHA videos because、uh, Tim Holtz acts like artists just now discovered alcohol inks like in 2014. And so it's adorable because、uh, comic artists and、um, manga influenced artists and manga ka in Japan have been using alcohol inks for like 20 years plus. So that's really cute. It's adorable that、uh, <laughs> you can. Live in that kind of a bubble.、Uh, but they always recommend like their particular glossy papers. You know, you can't use, you shouldn't use alcohol inks on other stuff, just not the same, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's, that's not the case at all. It's really what you want out of your application, plus, experimentation will give you the result you're looking for. So, don't be fooled, is really where I was going with that. Don't be fooled by somebody who is fairly new to the product themselves.、Uh, it's great that they make all these products and they have some really excellent products that I highly recommend. But, like, they're the, the amount of experimentation they do and the amount of research they do regarding use case or how other people have been utilizing. Not only their products, but com competing products by other companies is just like so lacking. Is that, is that common to live in like a professional bubble? As an artist, that blows my mind. I literally could not afford to do that. You know, like that would cost me any chance of a career because somebody with a great idea is going to lap me. And if I just live in a bubble,、um, you know, I'll like never be able to regain that, that ground. You know, it's important to always be, as an artist, it's important to always look for new ideas, new ways of thinking, new uses for products you already own, ways you can extend your collection. So, I, to, <laughs> to hear that kind of stuff, I'm just like, really? You really think that? It's like when I hear other comic artists talk about how they don't have time to read other people's comics, and it's just like, what? Like anyone else's comics. Like, I would like to keep up, but I just can't. And it's like, that's part of the job. 
Like, the, we're supposed to be doing that. How do you get inspiration if you only, if you're so focused on only your own stuff that, like, you just don't have time to consume anything else? I just, I just don't get it. So far, I'm pretty satisfied with how the mint background is coming out. I didn't want it to look hyper realistic and I am going to go in and like hit a lot of this stuff with Copic Opaque White and a Signo Pen a little bit later on. I am going to go a little bit darker with the green just in some areas to sort of blend out that indigo. I remember in fact when I was just like a little baby artist just really getting passionate and having a DeviantArt account and seeing people 10 years my senior using Copics to make things. I guess I was like 13, 14, maybe 15. Um, right, so like those alcohol markers were already on the scene. Um, and I know like ugh, designers used alcohol markers, like uh, pro markers and um, chart pack markers, which are technically I think xylene based markers, but you know, they're in the same family of art markers using those in like, I'm not old enough to remember this, but I have books on it from like the seventies, you know? So like these have had an art, commercial art application for a really, really long time. Uh, I'm sure this is a surprise to absolutely nobody on this channel at this point, but I read a lot of comics, I read a lot of manga and um, I like older titles and a lot of the beautiful like spread illustrations that you'll see in like art books because in the US our, our publishing companies usually can't afford to print the color spreads. Um, just to stay under that $10 price point they've been at for like the past 15 years, which kind of blows my mind that they can afford to do that. Um, anyway, a lot of those beautiful spreads were done with like Neo Pico alcohol markers or Copic alcohol markers, right? So like there are a lot of artists who have taken years of experience from, you know, that kind of work and have been doing it in the U.S. for a really long time. So if you guys enjoy that kind of stuff, I really think you ought to um, like one American artist who I know is, um, know who does that is like TSA Surugi. He, I mean, his work has influenced me for decades. Like I remember, um, being a high school girl and, you know, he was just, he was super popular on DeviantArt when I was in high school and like looking at his work and just being like in total awe at how beautiful it was. And he handles the markers differently than I handle the markers. I mean, every every artist is going to handle the markers differently. Um, I am very, very heavy handed compared to a lot of other artists. Um, and that's, I'm heavy handed with my watercolors too. Um, so, you know, it, it's the same sort of aesthetic appeal for me. And I've had other people like, comment on my blog that I'm just doing it wrong. And it's like, really? If I get the result I want at the end and it looks good, am I really doing it wrong? I mean, I'm not like putting the alcohol ink in my mouth and then spitting it out on the paper in order to get a splatter effect. Now that would be dangerous, but you know, is that even, is that even wrong? I mean, if I'm applying my masking frisket wrong, I would like to know that that's important because I am having issues with it, but Oh, nuts! Doggone it! Stupid frisket tore out my paper. That's gonna definitely affect. That's the first time that's happened to. This means I'm gonna have two, two products that I can't use anymore. Ugh! First time it happened. Um, yeah, it's gonna be. There's gonna be a difference in tone where it tore, and it also seeped under her hand, which isn't surprising in the least. using an X-Acto knife to kind of correct that situation. That's frustrating that it tore. It tore from the edge too. I don't understand why it tore because there was no, there were no faults in the paper, if that makes sense. Anyway, that's annoying as I'll get out. So I'm going to try and push some of the ink 
further down into the, because that's what you're doing when you apply, with alcohol markers, when you apply Colorless Blender, is you're basically pushing the ink to the back of the page. And I would flip this over to show you guys, but um, this is attached to a block, so I'll have to remember to do that afterwards. That's so frustrating. I don't know why I put those green markers away either, because it's gross because I'm gonna need to go in and do the mint. Since I was doing the, the mint, I'm gonna continue working on the mint, um, even on her. And I'm gonna go ahead and fill in with Nile Green. And I think I'm actually gonna do something a little different than I normally do. I'm gonna go back in with a lighter color around those edges and sort of blend it out so it looks like the light's hitting it. And uh, the, technically, this is not a tutorial. This is a, a Sailor Rio Fuca test because I'm looking to replace my Rio Fuca, I mean, my, my alcohol slash waterproof marker supplier. So, uh, so far, we're not having, I'm not having any problems with smearing. I'm not having any problems with, um, the, the Rio Fuca has not given me any problems. Some other things have given me some problems today, but not the Rio Fuca. So we're gonna go back in with this lighter green, and this is G82, in case you're curious. And another nice thing about these uh, slightly textured, but not too rough, but uh, absorb, you know, thicker, non-coated watercolor papers is you can also use your color pencils on it. And it's a lot easier to use color pencils on this than it is to use on coated marker papers. With coated marker papers, sometimes you even have to spray it with um, like a spray mat in order to get, in order to get the, um, the texture you need for color pencils to bite into. But this has already got it, so that's like, Really, if you enjoy using mixed media, and I recommend you explore mixed media with alcohol markers, watercolor, and um, shoot, color pencils. Had a brain fart there. Uh, really, this sort of paper, and this is fluid watercolor paper. You can get it all sorts of places. Uh, I usually forget I need it, and then I have to order it from, from uh, Amazon but I usually forget I need it until I really need it. And then, you know, it's like last minute, two days shipping, hurry up! So that's where I get a lot of mine and I'll link it in the description below. And it actually responded fairly well, better than I thought it would. Uh, blues are a little less staining than reds. So um, with reds, you can try, but you know, you're probably gonna be putting some sort of correction fluid over it. And speaking of color pencils, that's actually, you know, a really good use case for color pencils. Actually, you know what, instead of doing shading on her, I think I might actually pull out watercolors to do the shading and do like a mixing media thing the way I do with my, um, I do these like succulents illustrations. Can check those out i think on my behance and definitely on my blog and i had some for sale on my website a while back but people snatched them up at mechacon they're very, i mean mtax they're very popular uh but i use mixed media for those but i think i'll do that for this as well and that way you guys can see it in like sort of a different context So I do a lot, outside of conventions and traveling, I do a lot of working from home. Um, and I work in my apartment. And uh, I really, sometimes I really have to like put a ban, a personal ban on like Facebook and Twitter before, like say five o'clock, like I gotta get some work done. And um, so I just caught myself staring at Facebook for like, I don't know, 15 minutes, not, not even for any good reason. Um, I went on because I am friends with a bunch of other artists in Nashville and we like to hang out a lot. So we were making plans for the weekend. Uh, we're going to do a work train 
And if you guys are not familiar with Work Train, I highly recommend it if you have artist friends. Um, we're all basically going to bring like our convention stuff that needs to get done uh, and just like assemble it at someone's house and keep company. And I mean, that really just makes the time pass by so much faster. And I used to do work trains when I was at SCAD and I really miss doing them here because, you know, sometimes I'm just assembling like, I don't know, 200 sassy buttons. And, you know, that's not, not exactly the most fun thing to do. on my marker. Sometimes they'll pick up schmutz, especially if you use the spray inks. Those will put down like kind of a layer of residue rather than just like a little bit, which is why I get so annoyed when like my marker picks some up on the side of the page. And I'm just like, no, because it's it will like wreck your nib really. So um, one of the things about using watercolor paper with your markers is it is thirsty and you definitely need to apply multiple layers. Um, because otherwise, you know, you're going to get like a streaky, splotchy looking coverage. So that is one of the downsides. It will definitely use up your markers. So if you are adverse to refilling them, you just can't afford to refill them or you're using non-refillables or, you know, there's lots of reasons why you wouldn't want to have to refill your markers. I don't care because I keep, especially for skin tones, I keep refills handy. Um, watercolor paper might not be good for you. I know, one of those rare instances I'm using the colorless blender, and it's just to sort of, um, blend out layers of saturation between two passes. However, that said, one of the nice things about, uh, alcohol markers on watercolor paper is instead of just two layers of saturation you can get three or four so you can get you know three different distinct shades so uh, you could actually get away with having a smaller collection of marker at least I think you can get away with having a smaller collection of markers so you're gonna have to refill them more but you don't need as many I know for some of you guys the fact that Copic, many of these markers, Copic included, uh, are refillable is like, you know, you can actually use that to convince your parents that this is something worth having because, um, you know, it, it implies this like reusability and this sustainability that, you know, shows like careful, careful planning and like this is clearly not just, you know, something for little kids. So some of you guys, the whole smaller collection thing might actually be a real bonus. Of course, you're gonna get, like the indigo always ends up everywhere. Always ends up all over my hands. Of course, that will pretty much come off with rubbing alcohol. I think I'm actually like completely out of it now. Oh, that's why. I'm not even thinking today. I'm using the wrong color. I skipped one. I usually use E51 in between. And I skipped over to like baby skin pink. 21, I believe it is. Aw. Uh, that would explain. It's, like, it's coming out dark today. Sometimes watercolor paper will, um, you know, affect how the colors you put down look. And so I was like, wow, it's really not working the way I'm used to today. No, using the wrong order. And since this is technically a field test for the real Fuka, I need to state that I am still not having any smearing problems. I was having smearing problems earlier on some of the tests, but that doesn't seem to be an issue anymore, which I am very happy to say, um, because I was really excited about the idea of switching out my provider, person I'm buying from really can't call them provider if you're paying for it, and I'm actually trying to pull up 
the reference for the original that this dress is based off of, and I'm not... There it is, okay. I don't really know how feasible that's gonna be. I am trying to push this alcohol uh, marker, the, the green that slid through, towards the back of the page. Ugh, it's gonna be a nightmare because it's all built up. And I'd rather it be something I sort of handled now than something I encounter later. Oh, man. Actually, you guys can't even see what I'm doing, so let's, let's fix that. See? So when I put that mask down, some seeped underneath. And um, we talked about using the colorless blender or rubbing alcohol even to sort of push those colors to the back. Well, those are gonna catch on pretty much anything else you put there. That's gonna affect the color of anything else you use. Um, and I mean, you know, maybe that doesn't bother you, but maybe it does. So um, I could wait and do that, with, do handle that in watercolor but I'm going to go ahead and use, what is this, BG triple zero to sort of lay down a base layer of color and then I'll go over it with watercolor. Now, if I had just, if I just wait and handle it with watercolor, it will, it should not activate that blue. In fact, that blue caught on to some of the blue on my hand, which actually made it worse. So I really have to find a different way to handle masks because the seepage underneath is just not doing it for me. And that only comes from using the spray mists. And I also need to clean off my hands. I hate to use, so you can't absolutely should not use um, the Tim Holtz colorless blender to clean up your hands or to clean up your work surface because it is sticky as all get out and that will affect what you're doing and it'll stick to everything. I do have some Copic Colorless Blender, which should be less of an issue. And it'll work the way rubbing alcohol will work. Clean up, see, getting all that blue off my hands. And you know what? You can't see because I pulled out. So there was a lot of blue on my hands and I used that colorless blender to sort of mitigate that problem. I just hate wasting it like this. Cause that, I mean, it's not really a waste, but rubbing alcohol will do the same thing. And you can also use it to clean up and it's not gonna leave sticky behind unlike certain other brands will. course you also don't want to use dirty paper towels or napkins or whatever you're using at your desk you want to use clean ones because dirty ones will continue to put down ink anyway I'm gonna get all this straightened up I'll check back in with you guys all right so everything is now cleaned up only only wasted some of my precious uh, Copic colorless blender solution. I actually have a lot of it, so I'm not really concerned about it. Not in that container. I have like a big, <laughs> a big container. Anyway, I'm using this sort of blue green, A, because it reflects the blue green of the background, but also because since the background bled so much into the foreground and affects it so much, this is a good cover up color we were using a pink or something, it would be very jarring when there's color discrepancies. So it's actually easiest to do corrections. See how it picked that smuts up. It's easiest to do corrections if you're working with a similar color rather than a disparate color or even a complementary color. Yeah, the complementary color will tone down some of those issues, but um, if you get some schmutz mixed in, it also becomes very gray and ugly and it looks dirty. I mean, as it is now, her dress is starting to look dirty, what with the tear over here. 
and uh, you know the schmutz in the background and the fact that I'm trying to cover a fairly large area on a very thirsty paper and it's like hidden tiger crouching smutch because every time I hit some new it's like working with brush oak like you think you got all of it up and then you hit a new patch and it's really just with the indigo the indigo is a really it's a staining problem so I may have to phase using it out because it's just causes a lot of problems for me. Now, another easy way to do this is I could have just masked everything off except the white parts of her dress and then, um, you know, gone over that with like a Copic Wide in this color or even a spray mist in this color. Um, uh, but you know, using those, the masks, they do put down adhesive and they do leave their adhesive on the paper, which is unfortunate. Um, I don't really know why that happens either. So I really don't want to continue putting adhesive on the paper because that does contribute to like the schmutz levels. All the problems I'm having with my markers today though, I am not having problems with this real Fuca. So, uh, you know, it's important to figure out, to have a bunch of problems with it and figure it out early on rather than, you know, you're working on something you really, really care about and it's beautiful and then you hit this area where it just smears and you have no idea why. It's better to figure that out in a controlled environment like this here than it is to try and figure it out later on. And I'm just trying to blend out some of the dress. Some areas are a little more blue than others. Some areas definitely look dirty. And now we're encountering, let me zoom in, the first smearing over here as I brush up. But it's really the first, and it's pretty minor. And I have this, this colorless blender might be going dry, even though I just refilled it. Um, you know, that might be part of it. Because I'm not having the problem uniformly, so, you know, it doesn't, it tells me it's not necessarily like the, the pin itself. It could be the paper, it could be there was something else on that paper. You know, there's like so many variables, honestly, that I can't, I can't just blame the pen. And with the Mitsuo Ida, which was such a staple in my studio, and I really do love it, um, I would get problems like that from time to time too. And it wasn't ever really enough for me to be like, oh, F this, I'm, I'm not gonna use this pen anymore. So, you know, it's all part, all part of being an artist or a creative person, dealing with issues that might come up that's a big part of being an artist is when things don't go the way you want them to go you gotta figure out how to solve it and not just throw in the throw in the towel that's the difference between you know people who pursue it for the rest of their lives and people who you know they give up after two years and it was oh it was hard and it was time consuming well yeah it is hard and it is time consuming anything worth having is hard and time consuming getting another area of smearing, minor smearing over there by, you know, her sleeve. And it does make this dress look kind of dirty and kind of gross. And there are a few uh, cover-ups we're going to do that will kind of hide that. It's a shame, I mean, but you know, again, we had so many problems in this and learning how to, you know, hide your mistakes, especially on something that you're invested, not that I'm super invested in it, in this, but in learning how to hide your mistakes on something that you are invested in can really not only salvage a piece, but sometimes it really makes the piece a lot better because you put that extra time in, you, you did techniques and tricks that you wouldn't have otherwise done. So it's not a bad skill set to have. And it's not one that I see pushed a lot on, you know, YouTube art education channels. And that's, that's really a shame. Another area of smearing down there. I'm really just, I really think it's like this marker and my colorless blender are running dry because I didn't have any issues with smearing on our face. 
and I do keep my skin tones topped up at all times because you know I really don't if you're gonna get smearing the face is gonna be one of the areas that it's gonna be the hardest to correct though I don't like how dirty her dress is turning out that's something that can happen on covering larger areas, sort of like this, on thirstier papers is, you know, you're not going to get even saturation. And that uneven saturation does contribute to that sort of dirty clothing look. So I'm switching over now to a slightly darker blue. Mostly just to enforce shading. And you get yeah, this marker is definitely more topped up than the other one because it's going down a lot easier. All right, freshly, possibly overfilled, definitely refilled. All right, so sorry about that. Did not mean to shake the camera. That is way too easy. Um, so I'm gonna let the dress part dry before I add a pattern to it. And I'm gonna go ahead and work on the basket and her hair and her bodice. So we've basically finished with part A. I do need to add decoration to the bleh, decoration to her dress to help distract away from like, you know, the areas that did not turn out the way I'd hope. And I'm going to go, I think, hmm, maybe with some greens to sort of tie in the background. a pretty simple design it's just like large print vines following the shape of the fabric um, and again I really encourage those of you who are a little bit hesitant about freehanding things I just take the plunge even if it doesn't look perfect you know that's something you did by hand you know that's part of you in the design and the whole hand of the maker thing like isn't that why you're making cards or stamping images your, yourself because you wanted to have some of that hand in the make of the maker in there that whole handmade heartfelt thing well i mean this is so easy to do um you can reference real vines you could reference drawings of them you know nobody's going to judge you for needing to reference things it takes probably the same amount of time as like laying out a stamp and making sure everything was just right. So from that end, it doesn't even take any longer. I'm not referencing it right now because this is a pattern I draw pretty frequently as just like a extra design element. But you know, if it was something I was less familiar with, you better believe I'd be referencing it. And it really doesn't take a whole lot of extra energy or effort um, and it looks you know I think it looks a lot better doing it like this and then if you want to add some shadow you know 
you can even kind of carefully blend the two if that's something that's important to you. It's not that important to me right now because the colors are pretty similar. And the pattern also distracts from those areas that got damaged, which was the intention of adding the pattern to begin with. And I also like how the pattern turned out, which sort of ties in with that whole, you know, sometimes when you make corrections, it ends up making the whole piece a lot stronger. Um, and I was, I am going to do watercolor on top of this. So I need to clean up my work area and I'll be right back. Actually, before I do that, I do want to add some final darkest areas in her hair. That's important for contrast. All right, guys, it's time for a little bit of mixed media and we're gonna do some watercolor over this uh, alcohol marker piece. And like I said, this is fluid watercolor paper, so it should be able to handle the watercolor. And I use fluid watercolor paper pretty regularly, so I'm pretty familiar with it. Now, using watercolor over alcohol marker often does have a bit of a resist effect. So that is something you wanna be aware of before you get started that it might just be slightly more difficult than normal to accomplish what you want to accomplish. And it's also a little harder to wash things out, um, to sort of blend out the colors. Um, you know, that it is what it is. That's part of the product, I guess, so you know, if you're gonna use alcohol markers with um, watercolor, that is just something to be aware of. So I've already mixed up two shade colors, um, a violet, well, not even, yeah, it's kind of a violet, like a sort of a red color, sort of a red purple, I guess, as the first shade for the skin. And one of the interesting things about using watercolor over alcohol marker is that because the alcohol marker has a different solvent, you're not going to muddy your colors through blending. So it leaves a more pure optical effect. And that's just the first layer of that sort of shadow skin tone. So I need to allow that to dry before I can really move on. And see, there's like that, it looks like a bag under her eye if I can zoom in on it. And that is something that I can't necessarily blend out or dab out. I mean, that's, that's what I was talking about when I said that, you know, it's hard to blend out and it's hard to do sort of washed out effects because with this, once you put down color, that's pretty much where it's gonna stay. And it's not necessarily the paper. It's something about, it's like the, it's like the alcohol marker puts a seal on the paper. And fortunately, it's sunk in pretty quickly, so we can move in with the next shade. And I mixed that sort of skin tone shadow a little darker. So now I'm only really going to apply it selectively. And this sort of mixed media really, you can do it on mixed media paper. It doesn't work as well. It really does work best on watercolor papers. Um, but it can really extend your marker collection into something a lot larger than what you have because you're using, um, and you don't even need as many watercolors as I have. You could really work with a basic 12 piece set and do a lot of your own mixing. But it really does, in my opinion, extend the use of the size of your collection. So now I'm gonna use the shadow, sort of green tone, blue green tone I mixed to do some pre preliminary shading. And this is another color that I will end up mixing darker. But you don't really want to start too dark because since you can't blend this out easily, you're stuck with what you 
a down. So I'm trying to use a judicious hand. And of course, that mixed up, messed up area over there where my uh, masking paper tore my watercolor paper. Um, that is going to be an issue. It's going to absorb the water differently. So I may have to do other types of corrections with it. And I only want to use the blue very sparingly because there is no blending that out. But as you can see, it also doesn't affect the alcohol marker. So it can be applied, you know, really loosely in the background just to sort of, um, you know, marry the background together better with the foreground. I mean, unless you're going for a specific sort of look, you really don't want the foreground and the background to be handled significantly differently. So it sort of ties the two effects together. And that way it's not like stark alcohol marker background with watercolor shading in the foreground. It's, you know, a mixture of the two. So I need to let this, give this plenty of time to dry before I can continue working on it. All right, so almost done. Um, basically, the Rio Fuca has held up to everything I've thrown at it so far today. There was a little bit of smearing, but I mean, you know, I got that with the midsole Ida as well. And I often think that's more due to conditions than it is due to the marker itself. Um, so I guess it is a pretty good replacement. I don't know if I would say one-to-one -one because that requires, you know, even more testing, but they're very similar. And if you're like me and you're interested in, you know, replacing the Sailor Midsole Ida for whatever reasons, um, you know, that is definitely a comparable replacement. And you may even find it's a little bit more ergonomic. The Rio Fuca is basically designed so that you will use the larger in more. So for me, it's a little bit less comfortable than the Mitsuo Ida, which is the same width on both ends. But it's not uncomfortable enough that, you know, I wouldn't use it. It's just the end that I prefer to use is not designated as the major end. So it isn't quite as ergonomic as the large brush. But so far it takes watercolor and alcohol marker with minimal smearing, which is good. Also, the blue-purple I have kind of tones down the, um, of course I can't blend it out, but it kind of tones down some of the starkness of the, uh, that like lighter blue, the what was it, Moon Glow or something? It's like BG Triple Zero, whichever one that is. Um, that one was just kind of like a stark color difference, so it kind of tones it down as well. Of course, my problem is you know wanting to over render, and um, in this situation, I can't blend out, even if it's still wet, I can't blend out. It pretty much sits where it is, so I, ha I have to make my piece with uh, where I put down the paint. And I'm so used to like being able to move paint around a lot to get it where it needs to go that, you know, sometimes I am a little bit sloppy in my application. And, uh, cause you know, with watercolor, you do need to be quick because there is a window for how long you can continue to work things. Um, and that is affected by this. Of course, with watercolor, it will also dry a little bit lighter than it goes down. So that solves some of those problems. And for those of you sort of looking for a verdict in this, I would definitely consider or continue to use the Sailor Rio Fuca in my own studio, especially as I run out of Mitsuo Ida's. Um, I do still enjoy the Mitsuo Ida. It isn't necessarily a better or a worse pin. That's not why I'm replacing it. But it is nice to have more variety in the sources that I purchase my materials from. I don't like being tied to just one, one outlet because if they go out of business or they decide to stop carrying the product, you know, I'm kind of in a pinch. 
especially since I use the midsole Ida for a lot of my more professional work. So I'm gonna let this dry and then I'm gonna add some tighter shadows to her dress. And then we'll move on to adding white details. All right, so my watercolor is dried and now I'm pretty much just going in and adding like tight specific shadows. Whereas before I was just sort of blocking in general shadows. And it's a lot easier to handle with watercolor on this paper because since this paper is so thirsty, it does have that tendency to make everything look a little muddy because it's difficult to get appropriate saturation. Well, that's where watercolor really shines. All right, after that dries, we can go in with some white accents. All right, guys and girls, we're in the home stretch. Now we're just adding some white highlights here and there to sort of, you know, make the picture pop a little bit more. And I'm starting with a Derwent ink, yeah, a Derwent white ink tens. And I've mentioned these in other tutorials, but what's nice about these is if you add water to them, you can blend out your white highlight. So it sort of suits the picture a little bit better. So this is good if you need to add, you know, a sizable amount of white highlight and you don't want it to be too, too obvious that that's what you did. And uh, I don't know if you can hear that grinding, that lovely grinding noise in the background. I'm printing out um, copies of my color ash can for A2CAF and uh, my printer has decided that that is the noise it wants to make. So I'm just gonna have to roll with it. Hopefully uh, once this batch is done, it's the paper causing the problem, not the printer causing the problem. So hopefully we won't be having this noise after. We'll find out. Cause I have to print a batch of stickers next too. So with these uh, water-based sort of um, white additives or opaque white options, you do need to give your paper time to dry because um, color pencil doesn't really like to go down over wet paper very well. Um, and that can be a problem. So you do need to give it adequate time to sort of dry. but it is a good way to add areas of white that aren't super obvious. And you may find it's easier to blend than some of the other opaque white options. I mean, yes, you can blend um, color pencil with say Gamsol, but you may not want to introduce Gamsol to your, your piece. Whereas these blend out pretty easily with just water. And they also go down nice and fairly opaque. So, you know, they are a, a good option, a reasonable option. So, since I'm sort of on this topic, I'll tangent onto this topic. I want you guys, especially those of you who attend cons, I want you guys to think about how when you're in the artist alley at a convention, for many of those artists, many of those crafters, every single thing that's on the table is there because they made it by hand. So when things may feel like they cost, you know, overpriced, I guess is the word I'm looking for. You may think something is overpriced, but really you're paying for something that the only way it could exist is if that person made it by hand. I can't afford to make ash cans and like print a hundred copies of them because a hundred copies are just not going to sell. So I can't take my business to someone who will do it for me. I have to do it myself. I mean, the most uh, sophisticated, I guess is the word, the, mo the furthest from assembling it myself I can get is, um, you know, taking it to Office Depot. And honestly, I've had a lot of really bad experiences with printing with Office Max and Office Depot. So I'm excited to have the option to print those things at home. But they do take time and they do take money to assemble. I do need to have materials to do it. So, you know, before you start arguing with an artist over their prices, especially if you're a fellow artist, just take a minute and think about the fact that they probably had to make all of those things 
things themselves. That that thing wouldn't exist if they didn't have the gumption to manufacture it themselves, to source the materials, or even to find someone to make it for them. So, I mean, maybe it's out of your budget and you can't afford it. That's fine. I mean, no one's going to really argue too much with that. You know, your budget is your business, and I respect you for sticking to it, (laughs) because it's hard for me to do that, for sure. But, you know, just be nice to other artists, other creators, you know, or if they're selling stuff online, or if they're promoting a Patreon. Like, you know, this channel wouldn't exist if myself and my editor didn't decide to make it happen. There aren't a lot of people who interview artists at Artist Alley tables. There aren't a lot of people who interview convention staff. There aren't a lot of people who straddle the gamut between craft and art the way I do. And there aren't necessarily a lot of people doing tutorials on how to make comics. So, you know, if if I didn't feel like these things needed to exist, they might not. I mean, there's been a long enough time period for someone else to step in and make it happen if they wanted it to happen. And the same goes for any anybody who creates content that you enjoy. You know, just treat them with kindness. Don't take them for granted. These things are things they're doing, a lot of them are doing them in their free time. They're not paid to do it. They're doing it because it's something they believe needs to be out there. It needs to exist. They want other people to benefit from it. And that's a pretty noble desire. So if they do happen to ask for money, you know, the money they're getting paid, what little money they may be getting paid from ads or from Patreon or whatever, from commissions, that is not nearly enough to compensate them for the time they're putting into making these things, especially if they update consistently. And it's just something I just wanted you guys to consider because it's important and it's something a lot of people honestly don't consider. It's the sort of thing they need to think about, but you know, we just don't because we're so used to having things made for us and you pay a bulk rate price like with cable or we're so we have we've gotten used to other people paying for everything for us or we've never had to pay for our own stuff i know to some of you guys that sounds like you know <laughs> la la land but you you need to keep in mind that a lot of my watchers are young um and they're teens still so a lot of you guys you know you you don't have to budget for things you um you know you can ask your parents for things and they'll supply it but you know at my age which is 30 Heck, I mean, at, you know, 20, 21, I had to pay for my own stuff. I had to figure my own things out. So I've switched over to a Derwent Color Soft, which is non-water soluble, to start adding in some more highlights. Now, I could do this with a white Signo, um, but I'm choosing to do it with the Color Soft. It gives a slightly softer, less polished look, which I feel like works well with the watercolor. And areas that are still damp, which is a lot of this paper, this is not going to go down on. Uh, it's not going to, it's not going to write on. So I, you know, I'm going to have to allow this more time to dry. So I'll do that. Though I think I can lighten up her hand over here where the green sort of seeped in. Yeah, I can do that. And over here on the sleeve a little bit. Yeah, but I have to let this dry before I get back to you guys. And I'm I'm sorry for those of you who do feel like it's a lecture. You probably know this already and you don't really need to hear it. But I think I encounter it so often that I do think it's important to bring up. And I do see, you know, content creators, webcomic artists, writers podcasters, YouTubers who get talked to by their audience like <laughs> like they're owed this and you're not. I mean, I'm really fortunate because you guys are all my regulars, you guys are all very kind to me and patient and polite and I appreciate that. Um, I do I do get some stray stray voices sometimes with the art snacks versus sketchbox. There's something about that January box that just like drives people crazy. I don't, I don't really understand why they're so angry about my opinions on the internet. I mean, you know, from what they 
from the things they say about me, it's like, well, why do you care if you think I'm a nobody? I mean, you know, like, why are you taking the time to comment on this? You don't owe this company anything. But in case I'm getting any, any different eyes on this, I do think these are important important topics to talk about and I wish other artists would spend the time talking about it so you know I'm really just adding some sort of gentle highlights to the mint leaves in the background to sort of make them come forward a little bit more without um, rendering them so much that they become more of a focal point than you know the person in the foreground you can also shade with color pencils over um, alcohol markers. That's something I did a lot when my collection was much smaller. Uh, and if you're interested in that, I'll have to do a tutorial video on it. Again, this sort of paper, watercolor paper with a bit of tooth to it is, you know, great for doing that because it gives the color pencil something to bite into, which you're not going to get with the, um, like the, the papers that have a finish on them. So... I really only have a couple of things left to do. Oh, and that's another thing. Color pencil doesn't always want to write over. I mean, Signo doesn't always want to go over color pencil. So if you really need to use that Signo, you may find it takes a little bit of persuasion to get it to do so. Not impossible, just more difficult. And the last thing I wanted to do is since some of these lines got ruined, I want to pull out my Rio Fuga, which is what this was all about to begin with. And it held up beautifully. If it didn't, I would have been talking about it a whole lot more. Um, but I just want to pull out the Rio Fuga and fix some of those lines that got torn up. I mean, you really, really just want to have a delicate hand doing that. Some of these areas where the blue ink bled in, you can also lighten that back up with a color pencil, sort of hide it. What you really don't, when it comes to doing corrections, you really just want to be as light-handed as you possibly can because you don't want it to be super obvious that you are making corrections. You want to be kind of choosy about where you do your corrections as well. Otherwise, it really will attract too much attention. So I think this particular piece is done. The Ria Fuka held up just as well as the Sailor Mitsuo Ida. I'm very pleased with it. Um, I am still on the lookout for a better masking option. So if you know of some, I'm using graphics right now and I know they make a few of them. I am specifically using graphics, Prisket film, all-purpose masking for airbrushing, stenciling, protective covering, and more. It's the clear one with uh, low tack uh, 0 .00, uh, yeah, 0 0.002 millimeters, and the one that's not recommended for automotive paint and applications. And this is not an automotive paint or application. So I could really use it some help if you guys happen to have any suggestions on that because it's I like the ability to mask I kind of rely on the ability to mask but I don't like the fact that it leaves sticky all over the place oh and if you need to blend out Signo it is water soluble which is what I'm doing right now I'm just using a little bit of water to lightly blend it out there on the leaves so it's not so striking you can blend out Copic opaque white as well if you need to all right but I think I think that's pretty much it I think I mean I could like nitpick on these things forever and I really shouldn't and you shouldn't either because sometimes nitpicking things just makes it look worse instead it looks better. So I'm Becca Hilburn with Natto Soup Studio. Uh, I hope you found this field test that uh, ended up in a several product demonstration, but I'm gonna do my field test, not end up doing that. I hope you enjoyed this field test. I hope you found it helpful. I hope you found it useful. I hope you found it inspiring. I hope you're gonna try some of the techniques 
I showed you guys in your own work. I really encourage it. Uh, if you do, please send it to me. I'd love to see it. Um, let's see what else. If you enjoy content like this, why don't you subscribe to my channel if you're not already. I update with content like this once a week. Right now I have a huge backlog that needs to be edited. Um, so once that's starting to be processed, there, I will go back to my twice a week schedule. But it's like once a week, definitely twice a week usually. Um, let's see. If you enjoy content like this in written form, I recommend you check out my blog, natosoup.blogspot.com. I have seven years worth of this sort of stuff on there, and I know some of us do work better from um, text, than, text and images than from video because it goes slower. So that's why I keep up the blog still, and that updates twice a week as well. Um, and if you enjoy art, content like this, our tutorials, demonstrations, reviews, overviews, please make sure you share content you enjoy to your social network, um, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, even Instagram. It really helps the artists whose work you enjoy, the artists who have taught you new things or shown you new things. It helps them find more, a larger audience and it helps bring the art community closer together. Um, and if you're afraid of polluting your stream with other people's art, um, that's how other people found you is through someone who is willing to pollute their social media stream with your art. So just keep that in mind. Um, and if you really, really want to help out and you got some money to throw at, you know, at helping out, you can check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash soup for more information on that and where the money's spent. I'm Becca Hilburn. I hope you guys have a great day. I'll see you next week. Bye.